news really lays the foundation for Christian ethics. It's what we need to do, in other words, in order to be saintly people. But I want to preach more tonight on the book of Revelation and the gospel. We've spoken about this gospel before. Let's focus on Revelation a bit this time. Please note, first of all, number one, the word Revelation is singular. I've heard so many people say the book of Revelations. It's not. It's one revelation. In it, John, in the eye of the soul, if you will, sees this heavenly liturgy. And once you understand its liturgy, then the, you can kind of make sense out of the pieces of it. So you have ritual questions and ritual answers. You have processions. You have ritual clothes. You have ritual objects like palm branches and crowns and all the thrones, all this kind of stuff. So they're doing this in a liturgical sense, gathered together in the heavenly liturgy rather than the earthly liturgy. So at this very early date, John is understanding this action of the saints liturgically. It's fascinating to note that we have to do something in order to live as the people God calls. It's not always that easy, I think, but maybe it's easier than we believe. So often we get ourselves caught up in numbers in the book of Revelation. For example, 144,000. This is a mystical number. It means something in particular, and it doesn't mean that particular number. That's not the point. If you notice, 144,000 is 12 times 12,000. 12, does that mean any? Ring a bell? <laughs> Tribes? How about another group of 12? Apostles? You got it. Okay. So, from every tribe of Israel, every tribe of the Israelites, there is this huge number that are counted in this heavenly liturgy. And then the next line tells you it doesn't stop there. That's just the ones from Israel. There aren't many of us in this church tonight from that ancestry. Maybe there's some, but there aren't many, okay? But they're part of us. And then comes what? You remember? After that, he saw what? A huge crowd which no one could count. It's huge. It's beyond counting. From every tribe and race and people and nation, it says. Everyone. That's us. Here we are together. The church from Israel, the church from the Gentiles, you see. And we come together in this heavenly liturgy, and we're all sister and brother there. And in that massive number, we can sing and be in the liturgy together. We can do that work of praise together. Called to be a saint means that we're from a motley crew. I'm looking around. <laughs> Here we are. Who in the world would have ever put all of us together, right? Only Christ. Here we are together. The saints are an interesting bunch. I, I was making some comparisons, thinking about it during the week today. For example, St. Felicity, early Roman martyr. She was a slave. No account. St. Elizabeth of Hungary, a duchess, madly in love with her husband. They had children together and they loved each other. She was a good dancer, too. Okay. There's St. Elizabeth of Hungary. And St. Felicity, look at those two. How different. I think of St. Junipero Serra, recently canonized Franciscan, who was a tenured professor in Spain. He left it all to come to North America and spend his life among people who never heard of Christ. What an interesting thing to do. St. Bonaventure, a mystic, a theologian, a college professor. St. Joseph of Cupertino, another Franciscan. He was a dolt. He couldn't get his studies. He was just dense, okay? The despair of every teacher. <laughs> but the man was so holy that he literally floated off the, he was in the air half the time. Once he did it in front of the Pope, just imagine floating in the air. People saw this, they talked about it, of course. Because he was holy. He wasn't brilliant. He was holy. Saint Zita was a cook. Saint Benedict Joseph Labre was a vagrant. We call him a tramp. 
These are the saints. Sisters and brothers looking at us as a motley crew, of course. Of course we're called together from disparate backgrounds, from races and tongues and tribes and people and nations. Of course we're called together to be the one body of Christ. It's a challenge to really want to be a saint. I found this interesting conversation in print. Thomas Merton had this with a friend of his, Robert Locks, before he became a Trappist monk. They were walking on the streets of New York today, and Locks said to him, you know, you really ought to be a saint. And Merton replied, I can't be a saint. My mind darkened with a confusion of realities and unrealities. The false humility which makes men say they cannot do the things they must do, cannot reach the level that they must reach. The cowardice that says, I do not want to give up my sins and my attachments. Black said, no, all that is necessary to be a saint is want to be one. Now the question, don't you believe that God will make you what he created you to be if you will consent to let him do it? Mm. So I leave that question with you to ask yourself tonight, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all this week. Don't you believe that God will make you what he created you to be if you will consent to let him do it? Think about it on this feast. 